Cool. So I am recording now. So I guess this makes the second uh, meeting for Malware Club. And today we're just going to go over how to set up a environment for doing uh, reverse engineering or just different malware analysis challenges. Um, so uh, I should probably change the uh, tab real quick. But so what, what we're going to be using is Flare VM. And Flare VM is a script that's created by FireEye. And it just takes your uh, Windows 10 environment. Oops. <laughs> uh, and it creates a um, new environment with some registry changes. So it like disables Windows Defender. Uh, it makes some firewall changes. Um, disables sleep. And this is just the GitHub. I, this was another link I shared with you guys in uh, the email. And it's on Slack as well. Um, but again, so it's just this uh, PowerShell script. And um, let's see if there's a decent section. <laughs> Uh, so this would be the blog. We kind of went over this last meeting too, just um, to kind of introduce what we're going to do for the next meeting. Um, but if some of you have had a class with Josh or Brizadine, you might have used uh, Remnox before, or I mean, you might be familiar with uh, other distributions like Kelly Linux too. And those are just security oriented, oriented <laughs> distributions where they include a lot of the tools. Um, and just uh, infrastructure that you need to begin like your investigations or uh, challenges. So um, this uh, blog link kind of goes over it, but you don't have to go through this unless you want to just go through the installation yourself. I was originally going to have everybody uh, install it themselves in the iLab, uh, but then I remembered this installation, just because uh, of all the different tools it's installing, the uh, dependencies and libraries that it needs for you to be able to use these tools. It takes about a day uh, to finish. Um, and then there's some like tricky registry edits that I had to do to get it to work. Um, because if you're not careful, uh, some of these tools will be flagged as hacking tools by Windows Defender. And as you're installing everything, it'll delete it off of your system. Um, normally, the advantage with something like Remnox or Kelly Linux is that the OS is open source, so they can distribute those um, ISOs as like a you know complete package, or even as like a VDI that you can just import straight into VMware. Uh, but you can't do that with Windows. Uh, because of you know obvious licensing issues, you'd, you'd get in trouble for pirating. Uh, but uh, if you, know, you just want some more generic information, you can kind of go over it there. Um, but I'll tell you how you can get into it. Um, I th think we can. Can we access the iLab from? Yeah, you can. So if you go to iLab.dsu.edu, the link is in the chat. Um, you just want to go to this uh, projects cluster. This is where uh, if we push out any new VMs for whatever reasons for club activities, it's going to be under this projects cluster. Um, you might have used the learn cluster for VMs given to you from uh, instructors from your classes. Uh, but we'll be using strictly the projects. Um, so I'll just click that then, if it'll let me. Oof. Um, yeah, sometimes you can't connect to this stuff from within a VM, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, let me see if I can. Can you still see my screen? Or is it still on the VM? We can see it. 
Okay, yeah, so um, this is the projects cluster for the iLab. And you can just click on projects default. And if you're on the virtual machines tab, you should see something like a uh, flare VM. And this was, this is a copy of VM that I went ahead of time and created. It's just a Windows 10 image with the flare VM uh, script that you know, I went through and installed everything. Um, and Windows Defender should be disabled as well. Is uh, everyone at that step or um, do they not have the VM? I have the VM. Okay. Yep, it's up. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're having any technical issues, just uh, shoot it off. <laughs> It'll make things a lot easier. Um, so if you've used this before, um, you know, you can just hit power on, it'll start. Um, you have to make sure though, that if you decide to keep this VM, that like every month or so you log into the projects cluster and you hit renew lease with it off. And if you've used the iLab before, you'll know that when the VMs are running, they have a limited uh, runtime lease. So the VM can only run for like X many uh, hours. In this case, it's five. So if you're running the VM and you've been going for like four hours and you're in the middle of something or you're going to leave it uh, to like uh, analyze something or you're reading like a large uh, memory capture or something, then you just want to go actions and renew lease and then it'll renew again for another five hours. Um, was that uh, Arn who, or who just joined? Arnie. Arnie, sorry. Um, if you wanna get, oh, okay, we got a couple of people. <laughs> um, so for the two people who just joined, if you wanna get caught up, no, you're fine. Uh, just go to the link in the chat for the IA lab. And you want to go to the projects cluster. Um, and you should have a virtual machine there called FlareVM. So you just want to start that uh, VM. And then you can uh, just log into it normally. The password is in the chat as well. It's the default password you're going to see for a lot of, yeah, what uh, Presentine just put in the chat. It's a capital P password one uh, exclamation mark. So that'll get you there. Um, I have an alternative solution for connecting. So I, I like to use that. Um, So is everything going too fast for anyone or were you able to access your VMs? You're good on my end. Okay. Yep. Um, Logged in and ready to go. Okay. Uh, Arnie, Anthony, are you, are you guys good to go? Okay, cool. Um, so I guess we can just kind of move on to the next step. Uh, I just briefly go over this part. If I can find it. Um, oh well, I think. Yeah, well, this is the right site anyway. So, um, Something that we're going to do, just get familiar with the environment, is we're going to do the flare on challenges, which are also provided by FireEye. Um, 
fire eyes just they're like a third party um information security company they do a lot of uh malware analysis and uh threat campaign modeling they also do like a lot of uh, apt tracking so if you were gonna be working in any sort of like corporate capacity or whatnot uh, a lot of people uh, coordinate or partner with FireEye to uh, develop systems for tracking malware and creating signatures that they can use. Um, and it's also just a, like a lot of intelligence generating. So if you ever see like a job posting for FireEye, a common occurrence you'll see is that they're looking for people who know languages like acrylic, Mandarin, um, a lot of uh, languages that you see today when you're looking at like maldocs or um, any kind of malware that you could pull off of Twitter or hybrid analysis. If you were to pop open strings and you'll get Unicode, you'll see a lot of those uh, symbols. Um, so just moving on then. So if you go on to flareon.com, uh, Uh, yeah, it was, so I, I took a Chinese 101 class through, um, and I think it's NSU, Northern State University in Aberdeen. Um, yeah, I can bump the resolution up too, I think. Uh, this, I'm just going off of a question presenting had in the chat. Um, it was, it was kind of a interest because a lot of, uh, job postings are, interested in people who can, you know, not only program in multiple languages, but also uh, read and understand multiple languages. Um, just because a lot of the malware you see isn't going to be solely in English. And sometimes the signatures uh, that you can create, uh, or even just reading programming, and if they didn't scrub out the uh, symbol tables from like a PE file, that's a portable executable. That's the format for Windows binaries. Um, so like if you're running Internet Explorer, that's a PE file. Um, if the symbol table is still intact, which you can use for like debugging, you will see like function names or comments. Um, there's other things from like import tables in the resource section too, where you'll see like full on paragraphs or sentences describing the code. Um, kind of like you would do with your own homework assignments. And if you're doing them right, you should have like a lot of, you know, comments, documenting what you're doing so people can understand it. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's not going to be solely in English. It could be in other languages like uh, Mandarin. So it, it's good to kind of broaden uh, in that way. Um, one second. So this, I'm using Windows. Uh, RDP to get into the VM. So I'm not sure how I can make this bigger. Um, I think your screen is fine. I was just telling the students if they wanted to make theirs bigger, that's how they could do it. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm using Windows RDP, so it, it auto sizes to, to my screen. Can, can you guys actually read my screen well, though, or is it too uh, small? It well. OK, cool. Um, yeah, it sh should come out all right. So uh, yeah, so get on to the demo for today. Um, you're going to want to go to flareon.com. Um, and I can put that in the chat as well, if that's easier for people. Um, so that these, these challenges are maintained by FireEye. And we'll talk about this later at the end of the demo, towards you know the end of the meeting. Uh, but Flareon has their seventh uh, yearly challenge that they just published on the 11th of September, so five days ago. Um, this is 
the set of challenges for 2020. There's 11 challenges in total, and you have uh, six weeks. I believe it's until October 23rd, 2020 to complete the challenges. Um, there's prizes, rewards. Um, you, you can gloat to people if, if that's what you uh, like doing. Or they also said that they'll be sending out swag bags to people. So previous years they had um, like fake police badges with uh, fire eye uh, on them. Um, I don't know what they'll be doing this year because I, I they, they like to keep that stuff as a surprise. Um, but once you get to the Flare and Challenges site, you can just do LS and um, we we did go over this last time, but you can also do like LS resources. Oops, I think, oh no, CD resources, my bad. <laughs> um, and then LS. And that just lists some other resources that you can use. Um, one of those tools we will actually be briefly talking about today, and that's IL Spy. Uh, that's going to be pretty useful. It's a tool for analyzing um, or just decompiling .NET libraries. So um, you have like C, C++. Uh, .NET is another language used to create applications uh, for desktops, especially if it's um, like with Windows GUIs. So you can use tools like ILSpy and you can view that. And then those are some other great books that you can use. Um, you've probably, if you're already taking malware analysis classes though, you've already used the practical malware analysis book. Um, but so we'll just go back and we can go over the overview. Um, and that's just a brief description uh, about what the flare challenges are. Um, so um, to get the actual challenges that we're gonna use for today to get used to the flare VM, you're gonna go to uh, CD past results and we're just gonna do uh, 2014. So, you know, we're not ruining anything for anyone. <laughs> And then there are actually so solutions. So if after today you want to keep working on this and you want to keep working on like the 2015, 16, 17 other uh, challenges because you want to do the 2020 uh, challenges for this year, you can go through here and you can work on it on your own. And if you get stuck, you know, you can get some hints uh, by looking at the solutions. And you can get those just by going, uh, you know, CD solutions, and you'll get these two links. So you can go um, there, and it'll open up another tab. And you know, there's a description there. Um, cool. To get the challenges, you're going to go CD downloads, and then LS, and you'll see this 2014 flare on challenges.zip. So to get to this again, if you got confused with my rambling, uh, you'll go past, past results, um, 2014 downloads. And that, that, oops, that's downloads with capital D, my bad. And then that, that gets you to where we are. And you download this zip file. So you just follow that to the folder. And so you already have a lot of this uh, installed. So when you right click on things, you get like the Windows context menu. And if you're familiar with registry edit, you can actually go in here and you could add it uh, whatever context menus we want. This is actually what a lot of programs do. Like if you install 7-zip or WinRAR, they make edits to uh, 
the registry keys and they add these entries into the context menu. So here you have seven zip and you just go extract, uh, extract here. Um, you might even just want to use like another uh, uh, folder for this just because it can get a little uh, annoying with too many files. So with those extracted to um, actually get anything uh, to work on it, you can either do the c1.exe or just click the flare on challenge. Um, it just opens uh, EULA, you can just click yes. And you have to browse to a location where you want it to dump the uh, first challenge that you're gonna use. So you just wanna go malware, um, downloads, flare on 2014. Or you, you can put wherever you want, but if you're just following along. And then you're gonna click uh, OK. And then this uh, challenge one die exe is gonna be your first challenge. And as you progress and you get the different flags, um, you'll be unlocking challenge two, challenge three, challenge four, challenge five, because they're, they're all password locked. Um, so usually the, the first step you're gonna do when you get like a um, exe like this is you wanna identify what it is exactly that you're uh, looking at. So um, what you can do is you go to uh, the flare folder on your desktop and the flare folder has all the tools installed um, by the flare VM script. Sorry, lots of dogs outside. Um, so you have tools like uh, Android uh, APK tools. So if you're like taking APK and you want to disassemble it and look at the uh, Java code, you could do that. Um, you also have your debuggers like LEDB, WinDebug, um, or uh, those two. But what we want to do is, so we want to identify what the challenge1.exe is. So what you're going to do is go to the utilities folder under Flare. And these are all just a bunch of different uh, utility tools that it installed. So you have things like uh, API logger, monitor, um, commander, which is just another like Windows console wrapper. You also have SigWin. Um, which allows you to use some Linux uh, tools or utilities. But what we're going to use for this challenge is we're going to use uh, exe info pe. So if um, you can see that, and you're just going to open that, and you get a neat little. Uh, <laughs> cursor that looks like a hand. Um, but what you can do is, so just drag the exe info PE to the side and then go over here, uh, click and hold down on challenge one exe and just drag it over to the exe info window. And it'll, you know, uh, read in the file and it'll auto populate all of the fields. So you can see here that it's a uh, Microsoft uh, Visual C or basic.net uh, executable. You can actually get a lot of uh, other interesting information too just by using this. So if you wanted to search for like a hex string uh, or if you were going to view the different sections of the executable and you can kind of drag these out a little. You get the names of the different sections, so like dot text and resource.
you can see here that the original uh, file name was uh, ref uh, challenge onexe So it's just a lot of different like metadata that you can use if for at a later date you wanted to create signatures or if you had to piece together uh, several different exes to identify any similarities between them. But you, you, you actually don't need any of this information today to get the flag from the uh, challenge. We, we might go over this at a later date. If we were to have an activity covering uh, generating reports or identifying different challenges, um, but that's for a later date. Yeah, so we know this is a, a .NET executable. Um, you can even see here that they kind of give a hint they're saying explore and analyze uh, .NET assemblies. So you can actually use .NET Reflector or uh, you can kind of just drag that window off to the side. And there's another useful tool that we can use and it's included with Flare VM. So you go back to the Flare folder and you have this .NET folder. Um, and these are all a bunch of different .NET tools that you can use. Um, and uh, I've never actually installed any of these by hand uh, because I've just secondhand knowledge heard from someone else that they can be <laughs> incredibly frustrating to install sometimes or like just you might miss something. Um, so what we're going to use is DNS or dnspy.net spy. And you have to use the 64 bit version. If, well, it's if, if you want to debug, which is what we're going to do. Um, oops. Yeah, so um, it might take a bit for DNS spy for you guys to open. Um, so I'll just wait a bit. Just um, when somebody's loads, you can just uh, chime in. Uh, mine is loaded. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the next step after you get DN spy open is you go file, open, or you can also, again, you can just click challenge1.exe and you can drag it over to the uh, assembly. Explore uh, pane, you just drop it. And you'll see here it's uh, X, 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 X. Um, but what you do is so um, once it's open, you can just kind of keep dropping down through it. Um, the PE folder contains a lot of just, uh, you know, your generic. Uh, PE header like metadata. So you've got different information about the DOS header, file header, um, the different section headers, offsets, addresses. Um, this section though uh, <laughs> is probably the least useful uh, for, well, I mean, it is for what we're gonna be doing. Um, you can also just see from looking at the uh, PE section under .NET Spy, you get like uh, a list of all of the offsets. You can even see here under the eMagix, this is M MZ, which would make it a PE file. Um, but um, to actually see what's happening, um, you would go to, uh, again, just, you just keep dropping down in, into XXX. Uh, and you'll get to this third one here, just above the dot properties. Uh, and this will have form one and program. 
And it's kind of the equivalent of looking at main in a C program. Um, you can even see here, so you have the main um, and surprisingly, if you're only a little familiar with like let's say C code or Python, it you can generally make sense of what's happening. Like you don't need to know what visual styles is or oops. Uh, sorry, do not want to double click that because it'll drag you out to wherever it's being referenced from. Yeah, so you don't need to know what uh, visual styles is or text rendering to really understand what's happening. You just know that it starts in main and then you see something that says run, which is essentially just this method for form one. Um, which can be a little daunting because you have a lot of just, you know, net code that you don't immediately understand. But where it gets a lot easier is if you you go back to our flare on challenge folder and you click challenge one.exe, it'll run the executable. And you know, there's just this big decode button. Uh, you just click that. And you know, obviously something happened in the background because it swapped out your uh, picture of Bob Ross for Doge Ross. And you can see even the text up here changed to um, just some garbled text. You can click hitting decode and it won't do anything either. Um, but what this means is if you, so if you follow it, form one goes to initialize component. Initialize component is the function down here and it's, oops, um, this will be easier. Uh, initialize component, you can get just this function if you go over to the left pane under derived types and you can click initialize component here. But what this is doing is it's actually just drawing like the box, the font for the text, um, and the different labels that you see. So like the big button that said uh, decode, you can kind of just look side by side and you can see that this right here was for just the decode button. Um, and you can also see that the button decode that we we're looking at, oh, whoops. I gotta stop uh, fat thumbing things. Uh, yeah, so there you go. So you can see it was labeled button decode. You have a reference to clicking on button decode. So you might think, well, where does button decode go? You can just click it. Button decode takes you to this uh, function here and you'll just see a lot of this uh, obfuscated code um, because they, they uh, start off by reading in a string here and they have an empty string. They go by each byte in dat secret, but you don't actually see any mentions really of what you know dat secret might be. So one of the things that we can do is we can copy out this code here. And if you're familiar with, you know, like any other language, you could replicate this with JavaScript, C, Python, Ruby. Um, you just have to pretty much cover the general flow of the program. And um, to do that, we first need to get the, um, encoded string from the resources. So what you can do there is you just go um, dat secret under resources 
and you'll see references to that object there. And these are the different images. So you have a Bob Ross image, the Bob Roge or Doge image, and then you also have the Dat Secret here. Um, but this doesn't really immediately help us. Um, where you would actually have to go to see the contents of Dat Secret or the images for Bob Ross and the Bob Doge. Just close the properties, you go up to the resources, and you'll see here you have the two images the Doge. Oh, it's scrolling too fast. Um, and then also. Uh, dat secret. So what you can do is you go to the properties resources and you can actually just grab the raw content here. And what you would do is you just right click on dat secret. Um, and then raw save. And what we'll do is we'll just put this in our challenge folder. So we just save the raw content from Dat Secret, um, and you can just right-click it over in your Flareon folder, and say Edit with Notepad. It doesn't have any extensions, so there's no file associ uh, association over here on the Type panel. But it, it doesn't matter uh, because Notepad's just going to assume it's like a generic ASCII file. So what you have here is this is the secret message that it's uh, decoding. Um, and you eventually see produced when you hit the decode button. So what we want to do is we want to uh, capture the flag before it gets to this uh, final mangled uh, encoded uh, text. And to do that, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can either use the built-in debugger with .NET Spy, and you can start the program. Tell the program where you want to stop. Um, and then you can read, like, what's been saved in the program uh, under the memory for those variables. So if I had like a for loop and within that, uh, maybe maybe if I actually type this out, you know, uh, make more sense, not be total garbage. So if I had like four uh, in, this, this would be for Python people, uh, range zero to like, 10, and then I said x equals, sorry, for i in range. And I said x equals um, i. If we were to put this in a debugger, you'd start off at the top of the for loop, um, and it would iterate through 0 through 10 and updating that value for i. And then you'd be storing i in x. But let's say you're debugging it and you want to know what x is at every iteration through that loop. You would set a breakpoint at x, and then you would tell the program to stop that breakpoint um, every time it uh, reaches it when it runs through the program. Um, so what you would end up doing is if this were the, the breakpoint, um, you can just imagine that this was actual uh, code in a program. It would, the program would run, it would start this for loop, and then it would stop here, and you would see the values um, at this uh, offset in the program. And you'd, you'd be able to see uh, what the value was for i and what it was for x. And this is generally different depending on what kind of programs it is you're debugging. Like if you were debugging uh, 
a C program or just, you know, like a, uh, an executable that was uh, compiled from C and you were to, to debug it using something like WinDebug, OllieDebug, or GDB or whatever, you would see, you, you would only be able to see what's in the memory of those, uh, I'm forgetting the word, um, like you would have EAX, EBX, um, uh, Brizzy, do you, do you know what the, uh, the name registers? for it? Yeah, registers, thank you. <laughs> I had a brain fart. Uh, so if you're using like a debugger for like those sort of programs, you wouldn't necessarily see what's stored in those variables, but you would see what is stored in those registers um, at that offset in the program as you're running through it. Um, but the, for the most part, like the fundamentals or the concepts that you're using when you use a debugger, uh, they're mostly the same. So what we'll do first is we'll show how to solve this using a debugger. And then the other method, which you'll see more commonly used, like with uh, maldocs or malicious documents, is they'll, uh, they'll look at this obfuscated code and uh, they'll just copy it and they'll replicate it as uh, other JavaScript code, but outside of the malicious document. So you're not necessarily um, triggering those payloads. So you wouldn't have any malicious uh, like backdoors being executed when you run your copy of the obfuscated code. And instead you'd just be able to steal like the snippets of uh, memory or what's being stored in those variables at each step. Like a, a common thing like with JavaScript is uh, you'll see like evals used to uh, evaluate the contents of another function as it's passed and then stored in a variable. And you can get a payload that's in that variable. Um, and what you'll see people do is they'll just uh, comment out the eval and instead have it print out to like the console. And you can kind of use that in a way, in, in a similar fashion to using a debugger with breakpoints. Um, but it, it, it'll make more sense in, in a second, hopefully. It, does everybody kind of understand that or am, am I going too fast? Like I can understand if maybe I'm probably missing a lot of bases. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it, it can be kind of high level at first, just trying to think about the concepts of it. But once you actually, uh, when, when you do it once, or you go through the motions, it you know can connect the dots and it'll make a lot more sense. Um, so if everybody could just go to this button decode link, uh, or sorry, uh, button decode click under xxx form one you just go here button decode click we're going to show how to solve this using a debugger so what you do is you just go here and you'll just kind of read through the code you'll see we're reading in whatever's in this resource dat secret into this variable dat secret we have an empty uh, text string variable and then we're just going through each uh, character or byte in dat secret and we're using some uh, math obfuscation with those uh, bytes from dat secret and then we're just adding it onto uh, the text string and then you can see you have text where it adds uh, a slash zero onto it. And then we just essentially go on to the next string where we start off with text two. And you can see it's reading in contents from text, adding it to the next text two. 
And then we start off with a third layer with the empty text three string. And it's just reading contents from text to manipulating those contents and then just adding them to text three. So then what you would assume is text three, which it's returning uh, from this decode click, uh, or I shouldn't say returning, sorry, but you can see it's updating the title for that window it draws, the text contents for that title with text three. So the assumption would be then that somewhere between text three and text one is the answer for the challenge. So what you're gonna do is you just right click. Um, oops, my bad, sorry. I uh, <laughs> double clicked on the wrong thing again. Um, so on line 13 here, after you have this being added to text, uh, my bad. So on on this line 13, right after uh, you have those two characters being added onto text, you're just going to right click line 13. And you're going to say uh, add breakpoint. So what this does is when we start the debugger, uh, which is gonna run the program, and we'll be able to capture the different uh, contents of it and view uh, the, the contents of each variable in memory. So what you'll do is you'll just click start, or you could even use the shortcut, which is F5. So you click start. Um, you don't have to change anything here. This is just saying uh, what framework it's going to use. Or debug engine, sorry. So you could do .NET Framework, .NET Core, or Unity. We're just going to use the default .NET Framework. There's the executable you're going to debug. Any arguments you want to pass on to it. The working directory. So this is if you ran the, the executable and it had other... Uh, dependencies or resources it was going to use, like if it were using DLLs or um, any like XML files or other libraries, it needs to know what working directory it's in so that it can uh, reference those those files. And then you can also tell it to break at uh, initially when the process is created or once it reaches its entry point which can mean two different things depending on uh, how the binary was initially made. Like sometimes they can link things just after the create process before entry point, or sometimes you might want to start the create process and then just step through each um, action after that, or maybe even the same case with entry point. Uh, but for here, we're, just, we're, we're not going to do anything. We don't break. Um, so you'll just click OK, and you'll see it's running, and this window will pop up. So if you remember from when we first ran the program, you know nothing happens unless you click this decode button, um, because that's where this debugger is currently waiting for us. The debugger is sitting at this line right here. And it won't do anything until we click the button. So really, we can just go back to the button decode click. And you can see we have this breakpoint here. So it's going to call this function uh, after we hit the button. And it's going to go through down each line. And it should stop right here. So you can just hit decode, and it'll run. And then you just get this drop down here. And this is the, the memory contents of 
all of those variables that I had mentioned. And the one that we are interested in right now is text. You can even see uh, there's text two and text three. And those are null because, um, well, for starters, they, they actually haven't even been uh, initialized yet. So um, since text isn't overwritten at all, what we can actually do is we can set another breakpoint here at line 35. Oh, sorry, and this is if you're under form one. Um, in other words, you, you just want the breakpoint to be right here at string text three uh, equals the quotations. And then uh, we'll set another uh, breakpoint here. And this will give us the contents of text three. Um, so we've, we've already stopped at the breakpoint for text and we know the contents there. So now we're just gonna continue uh, to our next breakpoint with the continue button here. And that'll give us the contents for text two. And then we'll do the same thing again to get the contents for text three. So you can see here, um, this is the result of the obfuscation from uh, this block here. And that's it, just it kind of uh, rotating the different characters. And then you can continue again. And now you see the contents for text three. And this is the result of this block here. So and it's also what we see when, if you hit continue again, this will just allow the program to finish. And also apparently <laughs> cause us to lose our contents. Uh, so yeah, so what you saw, the contents for text three here are what gets pushed out to this title here in this uh, window. So if we wanted, and you know, you wanna get that flag, what you can do is you go, you hit restart. And it's just gonna wait for us to hit the decode button. So you click that. And you're at this first breakpoint which you can see has the completed uh, flag there. So what you can do is you can copy that and if I can find where my notepad is, um, oops, you can just save that there. And that's how you would use the debugger to get the flag the other method that I mentioned, which you'll see a lot with um, like maldocs in general, um, is to just replicate the code um, off of the maldoc, um, or in this case, off of the just the disassembled uh, or decompiled executable. So. One way to do that with uh, with Flare VM, and you can just close out of this. You don't actually need that anymore. Um, and you can close out of this one too. So a way to do that would be you can just uh, click Windows key and you can search for uh, Python. And what you want is the uh, idle Python 3.8 64-bit. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> huh. 
Um, can't remember how I uh, opened it. should be weird. Um, oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I opened it another way. So um, just to show everyone how to get to that. So you can either just Windows key and you can scroll down to it. If I can find it. Yeah, so you just scroll down to uh, the letter P and then the Python 3.8 folder. You just open that and you want the idle or you can also just Windows key and you can search for idle and make sure you, you do the Python 3.8 64-bit one um, because there's a syntax difference between the two. So with that open, um, what you'll actually do is you can just drag that window over there. And to solve this, what you would have to do is one, you need to get the uh, that secret string. And we kind of went over that already. And that was just this thing right there. And then you have the, oops, the first <laughs> uh, string. And you're just gonna go for I and uh, that secret. So that um, just replicates the function you have there. And you're just going for each byte B in that secret, but instead we're just doing for I um, in that secret. So you'd actually just be uh, referencing that one by one. Uh, one second. I just uh, have another window I needed to access it from. And what this is doing is, again, we're just kind of going through and replicating it line by line uh, so that we can uh, get the results in Python without having to actually run the program. Um, oh yeah, so what you want to do then is over here, it was just pulling byte B from dat secret. But what we have here is we're just creating like a integer indice for the string uh, array. So what we need to do is you go uh, B, um, just kind of creating the, the byte B um, equals Board um, that secret from the indexed i, which is just going to go uh, from zero up to the length of dat secret. Which, if you noticed over here, uh, dat secret is 31 bytes. So what it's going to do is it's just going to go from zero, starting here, up to uh, 30. So then B is now going to contain uh, whatever the byte is at that secret. Cool. So then uh, we're just going to 
essentially just almost word for word uh, redo the uh, math. I might have added too many. Okay, yeah. Um, and then you uh, like here, you just have to add the two characters. And then you can also just, you know, uh, print it out. So what you do then is you just go save. And you just put it in your downloads. And you can just say decode. That'll save it. And you can either go up to the run tab here. You can click run module or you can press F5 and that'll run it as well. Oops. Well, that's not good. Uh, I went through this earlier, <laughs> so I'm just gonna look at that real quick. Oh, okay. Read. Um, I don't know what the. Oh, whoops. I think I might have had a. Read. Yeah, not sure what the issue was there. Um. So, what you have then is so you have the dat secret which is just a copy pretty much of this line where you're just reading in the contents of that secret resource into that secret. You recreate the empty string. You have the for loop that goes through uh, each byte of that secret. You store each byte in B. And then this is also just like a almost letter for letter uh, copy and paste from the .NET code here with some minor changes. Uh, because the, the math uh, for the shifting, the and and the um, XRing is the, it's the same across languages. Uh, so then you also add the two characters and that gives you the first string. And you can also uh, you essentially just go through and you can do the uh, same thing for each. Or you could also just copy it and save it. Um, so this is, again, so you have the second string there. And you have a for loop. There, they use 
J, but you don't have to use that. And you're just replicating it. Uh, so you uh, have the range for the length of text. You do uh, That's right. I just noticed something, sorry. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, whoops. I forgot why I did that. Um, so unless you're doing strictly like a uh, for loop in like a C style, not using the ranges, you wouldn't be uh, adding it. Because here they go by uh, increments of two. Oops, uh, I keep hitting that. And to get those increments, you just do the divide by two for the uh, upper limit, and then you're just multiplying uh, i by two. And that gives us the increment. Um, but then you can just go run. And you get the second step. And you can see here with three, we're also essentially just doing the exact same thing with the empty string for text three, the four i going through each character of length two. You read in the character and you use the obfuscation. And then they add it, each character to text three. And then you're just printing it out. So this would be the method you would do if you were to just replicate the code you're looking at with Python. Um, so it kind of uh, is a lot to take in, maybe. Um, how is, is, does that sound good for everyone or? It makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, would everyone want to continue and do the second challenge? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, wow. Okay, it's 7.15. <laughs> uh, time kind of flies. Uh, so, I mean, we, we can conclude, well, this portion of the demo here, and we can do more challenge stuff for the next meeting. Um, or maybe using different tools. Uh, since y you guys seem to be mostly the ones who uh, show up the most often, I, I think that you would get preference for deciding the next activities. Um, but if you like doing these sorts of things um, for the next meeting, you know, we could do the 2020 flare on challenges, which I have here in my notes. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, so you can even see here that the focus of the contest is gonna be with VBA, which is what you typically see. It's Visual Basic, and that's with like maldocs or, you know, malicious documents. And then again, uh, .NET. Um, And we can we can either work on this as a group and see how far we get through the eleven challenges, and we can continue meeting and doing this, or maybe even people can do this in their own free time, outside of outside of the club meetings, um, and we can go over it uh, the next meeting instead of you know just spending the whole time uh, trying to go through each challenge. Uh, 
would you guys prefer to do these challenges in our own free time and then just recap on them next meeting? I was going to say maybe a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Um, what about the possibility of people working as small teams? Yeah, that'd be a, a good that one. Sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, don't forget too, if, uh, if you get through all of the challenges, um, Flareon will give you some supposedly worthwhile swag. Um, but that, that's, so that's just one thing that uh, we can do. If you want to get to the uh, 2020 challenge, you just go to, oh, sorry. So you go to the flareon.com and you just click 2020 Flareon. And all you have to do is register. Um, they have a scoreboard so you can see where you, you know, you stack up to everyone else. Uh, and then there's also a, when you register your account, if you want, you could say Dakota State right here. And then that would group all of us together. Um, but that covers mostly what I had for today. I know uh, Brizendine, he had something he wanted to mention. Um, I guess I'm not really sure what I was going to mention. Uh, while West hacking fast, if people applied to that, I think that we accepted everybody. Uh, one person submitted a wrong email address, so I'm not sure what will happen with that. Um, uh, fortunately, that person, that person who submitted the wrong email address was uh, one person in this group. Uh, I'll probably email them later. So if people were thinking about doing a wild bus hacking fest, they might consider possibly doing in together to do uh, the the meta CTF. I'm not sure if, if they're if, if they're supporting CTF teams. I would assume so. Um, is anybody interested in trying to do that, or nobody really is wanting to do that? Is it is is teams for that? I'll take a look at the Wild West Hacking Fest. Uh, if anyone else wants to, I'd be uh, completely down with that. Yeah, um, we can, if you guys want, we can try to coordinate it over uh, email because uh, I, I have you all on a, just a member mailing list. Uh, or um, we can also use Slack or Discord or whatever makes it easier. I guess we could do Zoom too. <laughs> Um, but I guess I, the only I, other thing that I was going to go to, to wonder about is if anybody wanted to nominate for officer positions or if you didn't, didn't want to do it this time or. Yeah, that's a good point too. Uh, cause we, we are looking for, you know, vice president for the club just to help with organizing activities. So if that's something, uh, you'd be interested in, uh, you just contact, uh, myself and Brizendine and, uh, we can talk about that. Otherwise, uh, there's one other uh, thing going on. It's always a good thing to put on your uh, your resume if you do become a vice president. That's true. Like if you know you see any job postings from FireEye, <laughs> which I mean we've kind of been focusing on today, not not for that reason, but uh, you know having some club activities, especially with you know reverse engineering, uh, would look uh, good. I know with uh, when I had I got my internship recently with INL, uh, that was it's Idaho National Labs. That was something they were interested in, uh, especially because they have their own CTF. They do they have the uh, Cyberforce competition, which is only between uh, other colleges and universities within the U.S. and each different national laboratory. Uh, acts as a center for the you know different schools to go to and compete locally and then all the scores for each teams are compared uh, nationally and 
So you'll have your winners at the local, regional level, and then you also have your national ones, you know, across the board. And it has uh, similar challenges to um, what we did here uh, for like their CTF portion, but then uh, the other part of it is like active blue team defense of uh, a network from the red team. So it's not, not exactly <laughs> the same in that sense, but uh, activities like those, you know, they, they definitely look, look good uh, on your resume. But then uh, in, in other uh, news, there's um, a meetup event. Uh, I don't know if Josh has like broadly uh, advertised this, but uh, it was uh, making rounds on LinkedIn and he's going to be hosting an event uh, discussing some uh, modern warfare, not modern warfare, <laughs> that's game, uh, modern malware. Uh, it's detecting, analyze, and reverse engineering. Um, but it's just going to be going over different tech methods that malicious actors use, um, how it affects your analysis, ways to, and effective ways to disrupt the attack. Uh, they're going to be covering different tools, skills for working with uh, malicious documents, uh, code binaries, um, and just, uh, different approaches in general you can. Uh, leverage with those sorts of uh, attackers. So if um, you're interested, I'll just drop that in here. I might have to ask Josh if it's open to students, but I would assume so because it was uh, just out on LinkedIn. My, my chat window disappeared for Zoom and I don't know how to get it back. Oh yeah, you guys can still see my screen too, right? Yep. Oh, okay, so you can see my notes with the uh, event. I think if you quit sharing, then you can paste it. Yeah, so I, I hid my tools for Zoom and uh, I, I can't find it. Oh, maybe this is it. Oh, yep, there you go. Um, there you go, that works. Sorry about that. Yeah, so if, if you're interested, you can just read more here. Um, join it. I seem to have forgotten to include in my notes when it is. Uh, I guess, yeah, okay, so here you go. Oh, huh, uh, my bad. Uh, so this, this was yesterday. I, I didn't notice that. Uh, maybe I can ask Josh if there are any recordings, if uh, people would be interested. Uh, I'll have to ask him about that. Sorry, <laughs> I, I thought that was uh, next week. He was telling me about this. I think it was. I think the group paid him to come and do a presentation. So I'm not sure it would have necessarily been open to students. Okay. You never know. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Um. Otherwise, uh, there's also a student employment option, I think. Uh, I know, I think Bridget Dean mentioned this maybe last meeting too. Uh, and then Josh had mentioned it to me, but uh, Josh is looking to get a student to help with his uh, grant work, developing uh, a Cuckoo uh, sandbox. And uh, I, can, I can pull that up too, I might as well. Uh, so Cuckoo is, if you've used um, uh, hybrid analysis or virus total before, this is, this is the website, but you, you can download it and you can build it. It's sort of just a, kind of want to call it, it, it's like a wrapper. So you set up, um, VMware, VirtualBox, or I think they also support uh, another uh, virtualization client that I'm forgetting. Um, but there, there were three main 
uh, setups that they support. You know, of course, those being VirtualBox and VMware. So you set up your VMs that you want to use with like your gold images. So you could have like a Windows 764-bit box, a Windows 732-bit box, and you could tell Kaku when you upload a piece of malware. So it could be like a malicious Microsoft Word document to analyze that uh, malicious document. And you can tell it which uh, VM you want it to use. If you want it to route any connections through like Tor, um, you can dump like the network traffic. So it would create like a virtual network adapter and it'll monitor all the traffic that goes over it. And then I'll save it as like a PCAP. So if you wanted, you could also uh, run it through Suricata or you know any other sort of IDS or IPS. Uh, it's it's a pretty involved system. I know Josh, he's done one before. Uh, I've done one before, and it, it it can be a lot of work depending on how much you want to put into it. Like even when I did mine, I know I I didn't set up everything that I could like with the Suricata, the Tor routes. Uh, you can do man in the middle or uh, honeypots. Uh, oh. Um, did they say why uh, they couldn't join? Oh, uh, this online advisor had emailed them tonight, oh. so they just found out about it. Oh, okay. That's fine. Uh, I guess uh should maybe make more announcements in Slack. Um, but yeah, so if, if you'd be interested in this, I, I'll, I'll put some of the comments in the chat and you can, you guys can look at that. Um, and then there's also the GitHub. You can also join their Slack. And if you're setting up a Kaku installation and you've, you know, you've done your homework and made your best effort to, uh, fix any bugs or issues you're having, there's a th pretty big uh, community that'll help you. And Josh Drush, I think knows the, the main guy who developed it. And if, if anybody ever goes to one of the Amsterdam trips in the future, you probably get a chance to, to meet him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if you're interested in this, then I think, you know, you can either contact Josh directly. I, I'm not sure if he had like any formal like links to uh, sort of apply for that. Um, or you can also just contact me or Brizendine and we can we can pass you on to Josh. But that that's uh, pretty much it, I think, for today's agenda. Did you have anything you wanted to mention? Very well. Uh, I'd just like to maybe open up the discussion if anybody has any questions or anything that they would like to ask or just share or announcements or questions or whatever. Um, yeah, if, uh, nobody, uh, has any uh, issues or suggestions and I think, uh, we can just kind of close today's meeting and then, you know, of course we'll be meeting again two weeks from now, uh, same time. I'll, I'll send out some, uh, more news over the email for what we have planned for then. In the meantime, uh, if you want, you can just practice doing the flare on uh, challenges and you can play with your flare VM. You don't even have to limit yourself to just doing flare on. Uh, if you want, you can do you, other CTFs uh, or if you get bored of doing flare on, you can email me or um, and I'll uh, send you some more materials. Could you tell them just very at a basic level when you're looking for a flag and flare, flare VM, 
uh, or flare on, typically what is the format of the flag? Um, yeah, so typically uh, a lot of the flags, um, I just bring up this. It's a lot easier if you can just look at my screen. Uh, but it'll say like flare on or flare uh, or fire eye within the flag. Just like what you saw with the um, the first text that we pulled. And it was uh, flare on uh, dot com. So if you see it in that format, then um, you know, typically you've, you've found the flag. If it, you also get stuck and you think you found the flag, but it's not submitting or uh, accepting what you're giving it for the zip, then um, I would think you can, you know, allow yourself a little just to look at the solutions for the previous challenges and that, that should give you some clues as well. But I would just generally keep an eye out for flare, flare on, or fire eye when you're looking at the what what you think is the flag. Uh, cool. So um, we'll just meet again uh, two weeks from now, and I'll keep you guys updated uh, via email. See you guys then. See you, everyone. Yep, see yeah. you guys. Yeah,